In the last of our first series of interviews, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Stefan Lowenthal, who is uh, in, uh, based in uh, New York, and he is the founder of the 19th century rare book and photograph shop, which started in Baltimore in Maryland and has also a branch in Brooklyn in New York, uh, and also the founder of the uh, Lowenthal collection of early China photography. And I'm here for him to tell us all about that collection of uh, China photographs um, that is an extraordinary uh, resource in the world today. Uh, hi, Stefan. How are you today? Very good, thanks, and you? So far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, the first question is, is a general question, which is um, how far back in your personal professional life uh, does your interest in photography go? Where did it all start? Um, when I began my business, I knew very little. It was almost 40 years ago. And uh, I was interested at the time of literature and the great people of the 19th century American literature. I learned that they were the same people, in many cases, who were very involved in politics and culture. And I became curious about what they looked like. And I began collecting carts de visite, which are small red, oblong photographs, as you probably know, portrait photographs um, of early American uh, distinguished people. It soon, because I'm an inveterate collector, it got completely out of hand. And I ended up with about 19,000 named sitters uh, in American history in carte de visite photography. That led me to uh, the great revelation, which for me was that in one of the great synchronicities, the evolution of replicable paper photography in the 19th century was simultaneous with the industrial revolution throughout the world, which was going to change both the nature of our world and actually the visuals of our world in a way that no one could have understood. So I became curious about that impact, the impact of photography and industrialization, the technology. And I knew something about collecting and I decided I would have to uh, focus on a few areas um, to begin documenting this amazing situation where photography arrived just in time to document a vastly changing world. And one of the earliest places that I began collecting was photography that was taken in China um, because the enormous change that was going to go on in China, sense, as much as a political sense, mm. uh, was so dramatic. And photography was there to record things that had existed unchanged in many cases for well over a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And that just struck me as an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, so early in the beginning, I became fascinated by photography and shortly thereafter, I, expend, I extended it from America to China. And that's extraordinary. So how, I mean, when are we talking about here? When, what, what, what decade are we going back to? Uh, was, it, was it in your, in your, in your youth? Was it uh, later in your career that this, this happened? <laughs> Uh, I started my career about 40 years ago uh, in my early 30s. I found uh, what I should be doing. By yeah. training, I was a lawyer uh, okay. and I graduated Cornell Law School, um, which actually comes back to China because my first trip to China was representing, part of representing uh, the Cornell libraries on the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of Tsinghua University, a okay. wonderful institution. So we went there and I, uh, that was an immersion for me. But so I've been doing this a very long time. And the amazing part to me in the beginning was that almost no one, with the exception of a few great men like Terry Bennett, who was a wonderful collector, is a wonderful collector and a friend, there was no focus on Chinese photography, either as historical or as photographic art yeah, and yeah. it then came to me as a uh, as a collector that this was something that uh, was a field wide open for me yeah. and 
that's why I really began working in depth uh, in China photography. I mean, it's, 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 so it's fascinating. I mean, that was actually going to be my next question was the idea of, of where the interest in China particularly came from, whether, whether the interest in China itself preceded the, the collecting the well, photographs. Actually, but, it's an interesting question because hmm. my first interest in China, my senior year in college, and I'll date myself here, uh, was 1971-72. And in 71, I had had enough and I only needed a few credits. So they let me leave. I went to New York. And for an extra final project, I went to the United Nations. And I was there in October of 71 when China was admitted to the replace Taiwan in the United Nations. Uh -huh. And that uh, really sparked my original interest in China before, well before I was interested in photography. So mm -hmm. the answer to your question is, from very, uh, the end of my college education, I became interested in China and started reading uh, about the history of it, the modern history first, and then as things do, I went backwards uh, and about what that started. And then when it became obvious to me that this personal interest was a fabulous example of my interest in technology, mm. uh, recording, early history it was a natural yeah i mean it's and, and also with this interest at a such a such a fascinating period of china's own history you know before you know several years before the death of Mao Tung and so on you know when 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 everything was you know the height of the cold war and it, you know a very interesting period of about really a, a nation that so few people in the west knew anything you know of, of, of fundamental and it's surprising how long that carried on i yeah. mean well into the 80s, uh, when I did start collecting photography, there really wasn't a very great interest. Now, part of that was China was just emerging, had not yet emerged as an economic powerhouse. Yeah. And due to the uh, philosophy of the government at that time, collecting antiquities was not something that was particularly encouraged. So inside of China, there was no historic photography spirit of collecting. Mm -hmm. Although the Chinese have always had great reverence for their artistic history, but photography just wasn't one of those things. And because of the vicissitudes of uh, that era, uh, not that much survived without yeah. getting into the details of that. So that uh, there really wasn't a lot of collecting going on and much of what was available was outside of China. Yes. One of the most unusual parts about my collection is that over 90% of it easily uh, was acquired outside of China. Mm. Both Chinese photographers and Western photographers, much of it had left China early on with missionaries, yeah. diplomats, financiers, uh, people who visited, people of all walks of life. Uh, and that's how Chinese history of photography really survived. I mean that's that's actually a fascinating point there because so much of the uh, so many of the objects that come, have come out of China have indeed come out in that period, as you said, through the missionaries, through the military, and so on. Um, Box Rebellion being a good example. I mean that that that, that actually that that photographs were valued. I mean it's it's proof that the photographs were valued that they they were brought out uh, as as reference points. But what's interesting is they were valued to be brought out. And many of the people actually who brought it out, as you learn more about the people who did the photography and who took it home, were people who were technical people, people working in oil and gas exploration for the Chinese government, people working in the various missions. But what is most interesting to me is even well into uh, the modern collecting era, there was no significant collection of artistic Chinese photography, recogni recognizing the great Chinese artists, Lai Fang and many others, yeah. who were taking pictures in every way equal to the West by 1870. And yet, by the time we get to uh, the uh, 21st century in the West, mm. every major museum has collections of these great artists, yeah. and they don't exist anywhere in the world for China, and even the great early collectors uh, were really collecting more in a historical than an artistic sense. And that's one of the hearts of my collection. My goal was to demonstrate not only the historical importance of the photography, but to bring to 
the museums, the people of the world, the people of China, the strength of the early Chinese photographers and also the strength of early photographers from the West who visited China. Yes. I mean, your co the collection really shows that. And I was struck, particularly by Lai Fong, as you, as, as you mentioned, that, I mean, just superb images and so, so crystallizing a moment in, in, in that late Qing dynasty, which, which is utterly fascinating to any historian of, of yeah. China. How extraordinary is it that it wasn't until this spring that any individual Chinese-born photographer had an individual show anywhere in the world. Yeah. It's just when you contemplate that for a minute, it's extraordinary. Then when you look at Lai Fang, among others who haven't yet had their day, yes. uh, it, you see that it's really an enormous cultural oversight. Yes. And that's one of the things I'm extremely dedicated to, is demonstrating the strength and the artistic merit of these photographers. Yes. And actually for, for the listeners here, um, where, where was this show? Where, you said it was just uh, within the last year, the Lai Fong, where was it? In Cornell University, mm -hmm. Johnson Museum of Art. And, and, and I'm, the, uh, you were, you were heavily involved. Dynamic. Yes, uh, but we, we are creating uh, an online um, documentary of it, which we're working on and that will soon be available. Uh, for people who were unable to get to oh. Ithaca, uh, which is difficult enough, but harder yet yes. during uh, times like the present. And that will be available on the, on the, in, in Cornell's, on the website. Yes, you'll, you'll be able to link it from our, from our website. Uh -huh. Okay. I mean, wonderful to know. I mean, this, with, with collecting, I mean, there's, there's so much that's been written about collecting, about what, what drives someone to collect. Was, was there a pivotal moment that you can remember when, when the, this this interest and this all-encompassing interest, you really saw it as your vocation. Was it was there a moment, or was it a gradual process? It was a moment, and the moment was uh, John Thompson uh, did a phenomenal book, uh, Travels in the, up the River Min. He went in one of the first Westerners to go up into interior China and the first to document it as a Westerner. Although other China photographers had been there first, mm. and his book is a magnificent, if you're familiar with it, it's a magnificent work. Unfortunately, uh, for a lot of reasons, only about nine full copies have survived. Right. And one of these copies became available in the commercial world where I operate, and I went to see it. And uh, I said to myself, the fact that I could own this, yeah absolute masterpiece of photography in fabulous condition one of only now it turns out that only eight or so are, are complete it was like a light bulb going off i said if you can get this you can get everything so this and i didn't realize yet that getting the great china photographer masterpieces would be harder because they were rarer but i wandered blithely down the path and i decided i was going to create what i call a foundation collection if you know what I mean, I mean, there are certain collections in the world in art that are foundation collections for different areas. Mm -hmm. And there was no foundation collection mm -hmm. of China photography as art and history. So, so that, that moment, can you remember when it was? I'm sure you can. Well, it was in the uh, late 80s. Late 80s. So, I mean, all right. So we're talking, we're talking 30 years now of, 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 of this, this focus um, on, on something that is, that is a, a, a vocation. From the other end of things, what, what do you think, I mean, what do you hope that the legacy of this collection will stand for? Well, there are two legacies that I hope uh, will happen. One is, uh, if I had my druthers, which one doesn't always have in life, I'd like to see the collection uh, end up in China as the foundation collection in mainland China. Mm -hmm. It is uh, something that belongs there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we had our show at Tsinghua University, mm -hmm. uh, it was wildly popular and the people there were extremely cooperative. They helped create, and basically they created a wonderful uh, monograph on the exhibition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to see it. That would be a, a fitting legacy in part. But the broader legacy is to bring awareness to these early photographers on the Western side who went 
around the world toting cameras, mm -hmm. glass plates, dangerous chemicals, mm -hmm. all the way across the oceans to document this fabulous nation of China. And on the other hand, to document how quickly the people of China took up photography within a decade. There were extraordinary photographic operations in China by Chinese that are as fine as any photographer the West has ever produced, in my opinion. So, I mean, this would make a fantastic legacy. And in fact, with, I mean, upwards of 21,000 uh, images in the, in the collection, uh, and, and, and that sort of value of it being an aesthetic ob object as well as it being a, a sort of documentary object. Um, I mean, what makes you, you know, you describe these, these Chinese photography studios uh, and, and the quality of them. What, what makes a, a truly great photograph in, in your connoisseurial opinion? Well, there are, there are many things that make a great photograph, just as there are many photographers of vastly different talents who have uh, become part of the long lasting history of photography. For me, I think it's a natural moment in time or perspective of humanity from a unique perspective by an individual who has the technical capacity to produce not only uh, a clear visual image, but an image that reflects a unique perspective. Mm. So yep. those are the, uh, the parts of what goes into a photograph. Now, I'm dated. I'm a 19th century photography man. And if you go into more modern photography, things change a lot. But for me, it's the te technical mastery of these very difficult large cameras with glass plates mm. that have to be carted around. And it isn't like a modern camera where you snap 12, 14 pictures and you pick your best picture. You had to set your camera up and very often you had to get one shot on your glass plate or two and it's a much more difficult and challenging task mm -hmm. and yet there were people both in the west and in china who mastered this technology and made pictures of depth and detail that really aren't surpassed today yes i mean and, and actually from what you've described this whole process that you've described so much nearer the the sort of art, art making process i mean it's very very close to any other technique or material that you choose to mention is is, is that construction of the image uh, well, there's, there's an interesting perspective that i'm i'm a strong believer in i'm in a minority the modern world where we have everyone with cameras walking around on the street the visual aspects of history have become the dynamic uh, presentation i mean when you go back to earlier times, it was the written history that lasted. What I love about early 19th century photography is step to this visualization of our culture and our history. And uh, that becomes this immense billowing number of photographs that are created, yet we forget the difficulty, which you've obviously know and understand, of these early photographers, what they accomplished to preserve with early technology mm -hmm. images that would have been lost forever, in some cases intentionally and in some cases yeah. unintentionally. I mean, you really bring to life the idea of, of China's own history and with your, your, your hopes for the legacy of it belonging in China. And I mean, my, my final question is really, with that idea, that bilateral relationship and the idea of history going home, you mentioned you, you had this exhibition at Sinhua University. Could you uh, just say what year that was in? Uh, it was three years ago. Three years ago, so 2017. So th that exhibition is already showing how that bilateral relationship... Well, uh, and I'll tell worked. you, one of the things that impressed me most was the... Office of the Cultural Attaché of China in New York encouraged us. He set us up with the university and in the university, Sudan and at the museum and his fellow scholars made this an absolutely remarkable event. I speak no Chinese mm -hmm. and they were able to tolerate me and bring me forward to take this collection which represents so much of China and to help me get a new appreciation for the Chinese perspective 
on these important historical and artistic objects. So what I love about a photograph is there's no verbal uh, restraint on it. It can transcend language. So if you do a, a photography exhibit, whether it's at Cornell or at Singla, it's something that transcends language and it can be appreciated. And it's one of the great arts and has to be recognized as such. Yes. So this great art, this great aesthetic uh, uh, substance the, of, of, of the object in itself, what you describe is effectively a form of soft diplomacy. I mean, it's, it's, about, it's about those shared histories and the different histories as well, uh, you know, working, working together between, uh, between nations, between collectors, between institutions. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's well, a sort of... I was, uh, if you really think about doing... Uh, a, a bilingual catalog mm -hmm. between people who are not have no Chinese and people who had more English than we have Chinese, but still we're not expert in technical English. And to come out with a fabulous catalog that will immortalize this, that is the kind of intercultural sharing mm -hmm. that should be what art is about. Art should be across national boundaries and feel very strongly the photographic art of China has not been recognized, it's a very fertile ground for additional shared opportunities, additional exhibitions, and uh, cultural alliances between two great countries. Yeah. That, I mean, it's fantastic to hear. And we're looking, we look forward to when your, the Cornell catalog is, is uh, when, when the, the film, sorry, that, that's, that's being made, the documentary, uh, looking forward, we'll be look, on the lookout for that uh, in, the, in the near future. So, Stefan, thank you so much for your time. It, it's, it's fascinating. I could talk to you for hours. Uh, a fascinating introduction here for, for, for LACA, for, our, uh, for, the, for the launch of LACA. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for taking the time, and uh, I hope it was relatively coherent. Absolutely. <laughs>